Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Tides of Death. So, um, we're going to talk about the area we're going to be playing in. Um, I'm going to bring up a map for us to look at together. Or at least, you know, for Twitch chat to see, because you guys can't see what I'm showing you. Um, so this here is our island section. The map isn't, you know, complete or anything, but essentially we've got three concentric rings of islands. Um, and these islands are is centered around a storm or a storm is centered around them. The storm spins clockwise and there is said to be a whirlpool at the very center of the center ring of islands. And so you've got the tides are constantly churning in a clockwise direction, but it's like an inward clockwise spiral. So if you're trying to sail um, in the Dardens, let's say you're you're starting out over here on you know this random island or whatever, and you want to sail inward, you actually have to sail in like a big clockwise circle all the way around. Um, if you want to go inland, it takes a half rotation more or less to get to the next chain on the inside. And if you want to go out, it takes a full rotation. So if you are on, you know, say this island right here that I'm waving my mouse over, um, you have to like rotate all the way out and then you'll end up roughly on the island above it. If you go in, it's a half rotation to go in because since the, you know, the tides pull towards the whirlpool, it's always easier to go in than it is to go out. Sailing out is uh, more difficult. You got to go against the tide. Additionally, so it's a bit like a solar system, right? You, you'll Mm hmm. Yeah, it's a bit like a solar system. Um, you can like skip just along the rings on the outside or in the middle or on the inside. No problem. Um, and I, you know, I've got a complex chart for measurements and time, so we don't have to worry about all that too much. Um, the other part of this is that the islands towards the middle are larger, uh, just in terms of landmass, also in terms of population, in terms of technology, and in terms of like center of the empire. Because the empire is the the core five islands at the middle is where the empire really thrives. That's where all like the great buildings are, the great mages, the great temples, all the industry happens there. That's like the heart of civilization. Um, the second ring is where, you know, there's, there's 12 islands there, there's a lot of people, they're kind of big, the Empire still has pretty good control there, but it's not like the heart of the Empire. It's like, you know, it's not quite the edge of the Empire, but it's kind of far out there. There's a little bit more room for lawlessness. If you've played EVE Online at all, um, like the center islands are going to be one sec, maybe like 0.9 sec. The, the middle ring called the Midlands is going to be closer to like 0.6 sec or 0.5 sec. Like there's law there. You can't fuck around. If you murder people, you know, you, people are going to come after you. There's going to be ships of the empire around. But like the, the proportion like of them are smaller. Though? Yeah, it's kind of it's lower sec. It's lower. Um, the outer ring is very low sec. It's like 0 0.1, 0 0.2 sec or something like that, where no the empire has a presence. But like they don't have a presence on each and every island. They've got like a couple of ships that rotate through, and some of the bigger ports there will have like an empire presence. But there's 60 islands on the outer ring, and so like maybe five or six of those ports have like a strong empire presence. And if you guys are on like bumfuck island over here, you know maybe there's like an official from the empire who like helps keep logs of what's going on. But this Island is more or less going to be controlled by their own local government and the empire will like relate with them sometimes. So the further you are, you out, the further out you are, the more independent the territories are, the less uh, reach the empire has, the closer you are in, the more the empire is in charge, the more the empire is in control. Also, the closer um, in I'm you are, the faster the wind blows and the faster the ocean goes. And the further out you are, the slower the winds and the slower the tides. What were you going to say? The On the map, so these like dots are other islands that are yet to be. Like, right, these are just yet. placeholders. Okay. V okay, vague cool. placeholders. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm about to link you guys a flag of the empire. Nice. Where is it hiding? Um, battleground maps, Dardens. Here we go. Um, 
So here it is for Twitch chat. It gets a little clippy. Um, and here it is for you guys. This is the flag of the empire. And you can see that it is cool. basically like the islands themselves. The five in the middle, the, 12, uh, the five in the center, the 12 in the middle, and the 60 on the outer ring. Uh, and they're generally referred to as like the core islands or the central islands. Um, the midlands are always the, that middle section. And then the outer lands or the outer ring or the outlands, some sort of, you know, way far out there area. So if you are pirates of the empire, you're probably going to be sticking to that outer ring, maybe going to the the midlands from time to time where there's like a good score or there's something that you need to do. But if you ever go to that central ring, you're going to be in like a difficult situation. The the empire is strong. The empire is plentiful. They have mages, they have clerics, they have ships with magic tools. They've got ships with magic oars and magic sails that can self-propel. Um, they have, what did we call them? Roosts. There are three, at least three roost ships. And these are large ships that are specially designed to carry griffins. And they have specially trained griffin riders who can you know, wheel and swoop and attack ships or attack regions. They're all, all the Griffin riders are like level seven, level eight. The Griffins and the Knights on them have armor and barding. Uh, they're terrifying. There's also wizards and casters. So that inner ring is like, if you have watched Firefly, when they go and like rob the hospital on the one of the core planets, it's going to be more like that, where if you get caught, you're probably not going to be able to fight your way out of a situation. The, the Empire is just too strong in those central islands. So uh, keep to the outer ring, keep to the middle ring, only go to the center if you've really, really got something you need to do in there. But that's where all the best tech is and all the best mages and all the good stuff. Um, yeah, we are going... That's where the good shit is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's right there, right? I missed that, would you say? I said, so we're going straight there, right? I'm just I hope a not. Please don't. <laughs> I put so much work into this campaign. Don't go. Don't kill yourselves. We're going to be starting on this island right here. Um, you guys are going to be washing up on the shore, probably over, you know, on, on the outer coast. Um, this is on the way to Solemn. If you guys were leaving from Redport, the, the di this distance between these two maps is not accurate. Um, you would have had to like go up and around the Dardens a little bit and whatever happens, mm -hmm. your ship crashes nearby in the middle, you know, in the midst of this big eternal storm that's always here. And you guys would be washing up um, probably on the backside of this island. And that's where our nice. first few sessions, our first chapter will probably take place on this island. And then whenever it is that you guys first get a boat of your own or a ship of your own, we'll move into like the next chapter. Um, and it'll be, you know, the first part of the campaign will be getting a ship and getting your own mobility and your own freedom. And then from there, we'll be setting some goals about what you want to do with your ship and the piracy that you want to take on. And it'll slowly unfold and expand and we'll rope in some cool storylines and it all makes sense in the, the future. Um, let's see. We've already mentioned a little bit that about the wizards of the area, how they are restricted in nature and those that don't fit in are cast out or outright removed. Um, sort of same, same with clerics when people are found to be, you know, having the ability to possibly work with the gods, they, those that are willing to choose a stair, the God of law and order as their primary patron, uh, are welcomed and you come into society and you follow the orders of the white prince and those clerics that might follow other gods um well they don't always get outright killed but life can be hard for them so there are few clerics of other gods very very few um and if you are a cleric of another god and you're going from port to port you're going to find yourself in trouble pretty quickly so potato mcwhiskey you're a cleric of another deity or another patron or another something right who your yes. deity is is a bit of a mystery at the moment um that's going to be something that you're probably going to try and have to hide a little bit uh oftentimes clerics are evangelical in nature and trying to either convert people or speak the good word of their deity you're going to be in a bit of an unusual situation where that's not necessarily your jam 
but you're still going to have markings and trappings of this other patron on you. So if you are like walking through town square and you're like, by the power of so-and-so, I do this to you. You might get a whole bunch of people being like, what the fuck? Who is this cleric of not a stare? And like word could spread and you could get yourself in trouble. So you might want to like play it, play it cool. Keep it on the, yeah, keep it on the quiet. Maybe I should re-roll my charisma. <laughs> really good yeah. line. Yeah, just you know, be careful when you cast magic in public. Um, which brings us to casting magic in public. It's a dangerous thing. I want you to think of magic uh sort of like guns. Um, and people have magic just like people have guns, but you don't just whip them out in the middle of nowhere. You're like walking through a grocery store and you're like, oh, I'm gonna cast detect magic. Seems totally harmless, right? But at the same time, like if you're walking through a grocery store and someone like pulls out their pistol and starts reloading it, you're like, oh my God, what the fuck is happening here? Cause you don't know their intent. You can't tell what spells people are casting. So um, if you cast spells in public, you might find people nearby freaking out, running away, trying to interrupt you. They might think you're trying to fireball the whole time town they might not know that you're just like healing yourself or or divining what's happening around you um so you got to be you got to be a little bit careful you can't just cast spells willy-nilly in if you care what people think you know um so that'll cover our two spell casters here uh linguistically commons the language of the land when you say um, common you mean eridonian sure we're, we're just going to call it common just for okay. simplicity's sake. Yeah. But it is related to Eridonian. Yes. Okay. Um, do, 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 do. Culture-wise, each island is going to... It, you, you can think of the islands here like the the united island it's called the united islands of the dardens is the name of the empire so each island has its own ruler or its own ruling class who has domain over that island that is to say if you're on you know whatever island that floats some island which is the one that you're starting on the whoever the ruler of floats some island is ha, you know they enforce the laws on the island the empire the, the federation, the, the federal state, whatever it is, um, they control harbors, docks, ports, and they have rule at sea. So um, if you're out on the ocean, you are in the domain of the federal government. If you're on an island itself, you're probably in the domain of the people on that island. That said, the federal government can, with the proper edict, uh, enforce law on land. But that needs to come in like written format. The, the empire is around the god of like law and order so there's a lot of like paperwork and bureaucracy and there's lots of like checking logs and every time a ship comes in they have to like check everything on the ship or you know check the the papers of the ship and the side of the ship and blah 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 like so there's always going to be a lot of bureaucracy which can be kind of frustrating but will work to your advantage if you are the sort of people who try to like dodge around it because if you take refuge on an island the empire who might be looking for you can't actually come and like search that island without some sort of like writ from the the one of the central islands so being on that outer ring it allows you to like bounce around from island to island pretty quickly uh most ships going from like the center to the outer islands take quite a while to get there um let me just grab one of the standard empire ships um clipper ship if they wanted to go from the central island to the outer ring. Uh, where are we here? Oh, no, that's going in circle. Um, outbound. It would take like 19 days to get from an inner island to the outer islands. And then um, that would be a circle and a circle. And then you might have to like go around the outer ring a little bit um, again. Just take a quick example here. If you start on this island right here and you wanted to go outward, it would take on one of the, the Empire ships four days to circle around to get to this island. And then it would take 15 days to circle around and end up on one of these top islands up here. But then if they you were somewhere over here, it would be 19 days to get here and then a few days to get over here. So like travel from the inner ring to the outer ring is long and slow. Um, and it, you know, the, the speed depends on the type of ship that you have. You can heal mm -hmm. on a ship, correct? 
heal? Like uh, gain HP oh. from like resting? Yes. Yeah. Um, consi- if you're in like a non-threatening, non-combat situation and yeah. you've got time to rest, certainly. But if you have to like man the oars or you're like fucking with the sails all day long, yeah, then you're sure. not really resting. Yeah. Um, but if you can rest, then then yes, that you can rest on the ship. Be better than, like laying on the ship and chilling. Right. Yep. Right. Right. They would need you know time off. Cool. Um, we're gonna have a lot of different types of ships. They are broken into four classes, very roughly. Uh, class A ships are ships that are usually found on the outer ring. They are ships that are designed to maximize ore power. They have slim characteristics. They have medium-sized crew. They have very low storage capacities. Um, But since they are like maximizing ore power and they're on the outer ring, they are one of the few classes of ships that can actually go against the tide. Um, The wind and the tide are constantly churning in a clockwise inbound direction. And so it's very hard to go against it. The class A ships are designed to go against it. And since the tides and the winds are slowest on the outer ring, you usually find class A ships on the outer ring. Um, You can think of class A ships sort of vaguely as like Viking ships. They're often in that format where we've got like one mast. We've got like a narrow ship. It's only, you know, one deck high. There's no extra decks on here at all. And everyone is rowing and whatever storage space we have is just like fitted around wherever the rowers are. Uh, Class B ships are built to catch as much wind as possible for high sustained speeds. Um, They're usually found in the Midlands or in the Central Islands. Um, They, of course, do also expand out to the Outer Rings, or ships that move between things a lot are going to be this Class B-style ship. A lot of the Empire ships are this style. Class C is the... uh, They're designed to get the most out of the natural environment at the least cost. These are more like cargo ships or merchant ships. They don't go fast, and they don't go against the the terrain at all, but they take very few people to operate. They're kind of slow, but they have a lot of storage space. So um, highly efficient, medium to, uh, small to medium crews, medium speeds, high storage space, general purpose ships. This is, you know, you catch a merchant ship, you catch a trader ship, you cast, you know, any sort of random NPC ship, it's probably going to be a class C. Um, that class B is mostly empire ships or people who have like scouting ships or messenger ships or things that need to get somewhere fast. And our very last class of ship are class D ships. These are pure economy vessels. They have low speeds, low crew, high cargo. Um, in fact, they're basically barges. The, the small version is a barge. It's got a sail and fuck all else and you can carry a bunch of shit on it and it's not going to tip over but you're not going to be able to go very fast at all um you definitely can't go against the the current and you're not going to really have a lot of maneuverability um the larger version of these are outpost ships these are ships that might sit in between some of these island rings and just kind of like go in circles somewhere between the island rings and act as a possible outpost for a military or an out possible outpost for a trading ship. You can think of these more as like a space station that's just like chilling somewhere between islands and is always constantly in movement around the tides. Um, we won't have a lot of dealings with them, especially in the early game. Maybe in the late game, we'll see more of them. Since you guys are on the outer ring, to begin with at least, your first ship will probably be somewhere in the Class A section. Um, And I think for pirates who are going to be trying to outrun the law, Class A ships are probably your jam for most of the campaign. You might want to like steal a Class B ship if you're going to be doing something in the middle or in the midlands. But uh, mostly you're going to be dealing with Class A vessels. We will go far more in depth in this um, at a later point because I know I'm giving you guys a lot of information all at once. Um, we good so far? Yep. Cool. Yep. Ships of the Empire are usually going to be captained by a cleric of some kind, uh, maybe a wizard of some kind. But all of the like important Empire vessels are going to have a cleric and a wizard on them both. And you should be aware of the dangers of that. Um, ship-to-ship combat, we don't have cannons. We don't have gunpowder. We don't have explosives. So ship-to-ship combat is like fireball, lightning bolt, um, 
Lance of Disruption, or if Ooh. you are a cleric, Call Lightning. Call Lightning is a spell that we rarely ever see in most D&D campaigns because it takes 10 minutes to cast, and then every 10 minutes you get to call down a lightning bolt, where like combat rounds are one minute at a time, so you could cast 10 lightning bolts in 10 minutes, or you could use Call Lightning, and after 10 minutes cast one lightning bolt, and then wait another 10 minutes and cast another, and wait another 10 minutes and cast another. In it most situations... Like and raining right right and in most situations that fucking sucks but in an area where there is a perpetual storm overhead that never breaks call lightning is hella bomb because that the storm's always there additionally if you want to call lightning down on a ship you don't need to board the ship you just need to keep a certain distance from the ship within range of the spell it don't catch up don't fall too far behind and then you can just call lightning bolt after lightning bolt after lightning bolt over a course of a couple of hours and the other ship isn't going to be able to get close enough to you because call lightning outranges all other combat spells so ship to ship combat super fucking dangerous especially against empire ships because they can start their call lightning and then just try to get some distance between you and then kite you for days right uh, so if you're going to be going up against another vessel in any sort of ship to ship combat or any sort of boarding exercise, you're going to want to make sure that it's a boat you can take on because you don't want to be like on the receiving end of a call lightning spell where they obliterate your vessel from far enough away that they're never in a threat zone, you know? Yeah. So yeah. ship to ship combat. That, um... It's fancy and There's complicated. That cleric spell, whirlpool, are you going to ban that? Because that seems like... Was not like auto destroy ships. <laughs> um, yes, I'm still working on my ban list for spells for this region. Um, part of a larger spell project I'm working on, but yeah, there's a bunch of things we're just gonna scrap and remove. Um, etherealness nice. as a set of a third level cleric spell is broken, especially in this campaign, um, because we do the ethereal plane differently than it normally is written. So the etherealness spell as a third level spell is just like super powerful. Um, Whirlpool is probably going to be gotten rid of. Uh, Frisky Chest, I think, is getting gotten rid of. Um, what is the one that increases the weight of things relative to the person who holds it? Um, weighty Chest, we're going to scrap. Yeah. There's a whole bunch of these things. Um, I'll work with the spellcasters in person to deal with this stuff individually. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. Sweet. Um, so just be aware of ship to ship combat. It can be frisky. You don't want to make mistakes here. Um, do, 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 do. I have a list of like types of people that you're going to encounter on vessels. Um, I don't think we need to go over it, but just like a quick rundown of officers that you'll find on a ship. The captain runs the ship. He's in charge, often doubles as a helmsman and triples as a navigator, but doesn't necessarily have to be. Your quartermaster is in charge of supplies and pay. Um, the quartermaster makes sure everyone has the food that they need, has the pay that they need, takes care of like keeping track of all of the supplies on the ship, ordering new supplies. It's the second most important position next to captain. Some people might say the quartermaster is more important, but the captain has like combat authority. So they kind of like artificially get shoved up there. But the quartermaster is like the core. Your navigator is the person who tracks the ship's location via stars. We don't really have a lot of stars out because there's that perpetual storm overhead, but they will use other visible markers, charts, maps, whatever direction things they can find. Ships often have doctors. Um, if there's a cleric on hand, uh, clerics of a stair have healing spells, so they'll often double, but if it's not a ship of an empire, they might have a doctor. If there's no doctor on board, then the carpenter is the doctor. Because, um, you know, that's the next best person who knows how to cut things <laughs> and put things back together. So it's either a doctor or a carpenter. Um, Sergeant at Arms is another important rank that we're going to have on ships. That's the lead warrior, the person in charge of training soldiers and leading combat. Um, they're usually going to be a fairly decent level fighter and will sort of lead the rest of the soldiers and the rest of the ship in any sort of combat action or any sort of like land raiding action. Captain's in charge. Sergeant at Arms is like, you know, the, the go-to tank. You probably a higher combat level than a captain in most situations. Uh, your boatswain is the person who oversees the physical integrity of the ship and like helps patch it up and repair it. The ship is a big, complicated vessel. You can almost think of it as like a living organism. It's got problems. Things leak. There are holes. Things break. You lose 
you lose materials and need to replace them. Boatswain is in charge of all of that shit. Um, and those are like the major officers. Then we go down to Cook, Helmsman, and Cooper. Your cook runs the kitchen. It's a dedicated job. You have a cook for a ship, and that's all they do. And they work their asses off. And everyone wants to be friends with the cook because the cook deals you out your portions and makes the food. And, it, you know, is sort of the lifeline. If the cook dies, everyone's just eating shit food for the rest of their lives, and it sucks. Everyone loves the cook. Be nice to the cook. Nice. Uh, your helmsman mans the helm, steers the ship. Oftentimes the captain can do that, but if you're on like a bigger vessel, the captain's got other shit to do, or like you might need a helmsman while the captain's not actually steering it. Uh, it's a pretty important position, but it's not always around. The Cooper um, is also the it's the barrel maker, also doubles as a carpenter, also triples as the doctor if there are none. Uh, barrels are how everything gets transported and stowed, and the integrity of those the, the ship is only as good as the integrity of their barrels and their cargo. If your barrels start to break and you leak your water, or they start to leak open and your food gets rotten, you're all fucked, right? So the Cooper, the man who maintains the barrels, important role. And then we get to the last three, uh, the last category of four people, uh, a lookout, a sailor, an oarsman and a deckhand. So sailor does sailing things. And when I say sailing in this context, I mean related to the sails, to bringing up the sails, bringing them down, letting them out, letting them in, um, doing all the rigging and jigging and that sort of stuff. Your oarsman is a rower, and it is a skillful position. There have been rumors of, like, the ancient Egyptians had slaves rowing their ships. No, you would never do that. Um, rowing is a core part of ship navigation. It allows you to um, angle yourself a lot more carefully than you ever could by wind. It allows you to go against tides and currents. It allows you to, like, vary your speed. It, it's very precise, very exact, and hugely important. Ro oarsmen are trained positions. If you're an oarsman, all you do is row you don't fight you don't deal with sails you just row your deckhand moves cargo assists with miscellaneous jobs they move shit about they're just like the general labor workforce but they don't do any steering any navigation any sailing any rowing and then lookout is just like lowest man on the totem pole you just go and look at shit and report back when people yell at you um, and those are, generally speaking, our positions on a vessel. If you look at historical records, there's a lot more positions, a lot more titles. We're trying to simplify things down into like one cohesive system because reality is rare, rarely one cohesive system. You know, the, the Vikings had one system and the, the Romans had another system and the Romans in 500 had a different system and the British had it. You know, it's, it's complicated and it, it varies with the era. But we're going to use this like condensed list. Um, and these are the sorts of rules and ranks that we've got there. So that is our quick and dirty introduction to this region. We'll go more in depth as the campaign continues, but I want to just give everyone a, a nice heads up on it. Um, great. Great. Right. Brilliant. So do we have any questions about the world, about mechanics, about our characters? Any questions at all? This is the open Q&A portion for the cast. What do you guys want to know or get some direction on? For like a for like a class A ship that we most likely will be um, mm -hmm. manning, what's like the minimum crew requirement? That is an excellent question. Um, so a minimum crew requirement for a long ship um, would be four people. Uh, and that would be where you're not rowing, you're just using the sail on the long ship. That would be one person to steer, three people to deal with the um, the the sails, bringing them up, bringing them down, being able to change their position. If you have fewer than four people on a long ship like that, you just, it's not going to operate. Um, you're not really going to be able to go anywhere. You're just wrecked and fucked. So four people is like bare minimum. Um, if you want it to work well, you're going to need eight people for a long ship that has two masts. Um, a, a cutter ship that only has one mast, you would only need four people for. Uh, if you wanted to like fully gear out a long ship with a complete contingency of rowers, it would be uh, 40 rowers plus eight people to do like sailing and steering and stuff. So that's actually a fairly large crew of 48, you know, to 50. Um, which brings us to an interesting point. Crew. It's a lot of people. 
crews get complicated. They need to be fed. You might want to use them for things that they they didn't sign on for. It gets messy. And a lot of sailing type campaigns fall apart based on their crew. So your first quest, once we're like actually in the game, we're not doing like pre-character or pre pre-show, what do we call them? Flashback episodes. We're not doing like how who you are and how you got here. Uh, the first quest that you guys come across is when you wash up on shore, you're going to hear th- about some people looking for this um, these magic items that like make boats row themselves or make boats like um, automatically deploy sails by themselves. So your first storyline is going to be acquiring, hopefully, uh, the tools that you need to avoid having to deal with a crew and being able to like row a ship by itself or sail a ship by itself, which doesn't mean you won't need to be making um, seamanship checks, but it will mean that you can effectively replace a rowing section of your crew or a sailing section of your crew with a, a magic item. Um, and we'll get more details into that in our first few sessions, but uh, crew is a complicated mess, you know? If you have a crew and then you're like, we're going to go raid this place on land. Come on, sailors, let's all go fight. And then the sailors fight and the battle goes poorly and then you lose all your crew and now you can't leave on your ship and the campaign just like runs into the ground. So um, if you're in a situation where you are dependent on your crew to power your ship, uh, I would heavily recommend that you do not take your crew to do combat actions or combat maneuvers because if you lose them, then you you just get fucked really fast. Yep. I, it's an easy temptation. There's also the threat of like, you know, you've got this big crew of NPCs that in game, the characters are spending a lot of time with, but like in terms of actually playing, there's not really enough time to explore those relationships. So they almost become expendable in a way that they wouldn't really be because the characters would have some sort of friendship or emotional connection to these, mm-hmm. to these people in real life. Yeah, it just yeah, becomes too. sailor number 35. And who cares yeah, about exactly. sailor number 35, you know? Um, so it's messy. It's gross. Cool. Yeah, the idea of ships that sail themselves, I'm all on board. Classic, yep. literally, on board. I have been PM'd, and uh, it's not boatswain, it's bosun. I'm sorry. Okay. Bosun, not boatswain. Yeah. yeah, yeah, not cancelled just yet, but you close know, to it though. Link. Woo! Yeah, <laughs> close. Well, there was maybe. one guy in Twitch chat who was really mad about that. He's fuming. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he's so angry. It's fine. We, if you come up with any uh, nautical terms that you want to introduce to the class, um, they'd also be great. Um, any other questions? I'm sure they're hmm. out there. I don't think I have any right now. Okay. Yeah, I think I'm I think I'm mostly good. Yeah, I think so. Great. So let's talk our first couple sessions. We had chatted earlier about doing some like who they were and how they got here things. And I think those are really fun to do. And I think they help each character each player gets to know their character a little bit. So I was thinking we might do um like a session where we talk about or a half session where we talk about um, Potato McWhiskey and how they became a cleric, a half section on uh, uh, Nilrin, Nilrim? What was your character's name? Nilrim. Yeah. Nilrim. yeah. <clears throat> and how, well, you know, their objectives, how they came to becoming towards the Dardens, what they wanted. Um, those would probably each be a half session and then maybe a full session between Nick and Pokemon or maybe a half session there where... We can do like a quarter session on Pokemon by himself, quarter session Nick by himself, half session of them together. So that way everyone's got yeah. a little bit of a history between them or, you know, yes. each character has its own identity before we all get lumped together. Uh, and I think that sure. would be a fun way to, to start all of this stuff off. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, yeah. I enjoyed that. Oh, for, that's good. For the cool. Great. Um, so why don't we do the first one of those next week? Who wants to go for our first session? Uh, two people. Do you want to do? Yeah, two people. So like Potato and McWhiskey, and I can go at the same time. But um, yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, do you, you want to wanna... do next week potato, or do you want to do the week after? Yeah, I don't. I can do. I can do next week. Uh, I'll, I assume Thursday. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Tuesday. 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 Oh, Tuesday. Oh, right. We're doing them on Tuesdays. Oh, I thought I said Thursday. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, Tuesday's good. Okay. We'll do the first one next Tuesday, and then uh, I can show up for the first two hours. Then you can show up for the other two. Uh, I would prefer the the earlier. Time? Yeah, because it's kind of later for me. Okay. I don't know if that. Yeah. That's good by okay. me. Cool. Cool. Um, and then the rest of you, since this is all your campaign as well, uh, are we cool to stream this to your channel, even if you're not actively playing at that moment? Or do you want oh, us sure. to not? Because yeah, I think no, we all want go records of the VODs, right? Yeah. Cool. Cool. Me. All right. We'll check in yeah, go beforehand. Ahead. Uh, and then we will do Nick and Pokemon on the other side. Perfect. Uh, amazing. 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 Right, uh... Uh, so that is all I have for us for today. Cool. I think our characters oh. are good enough to go, and then we will oh, just... Oh, wait, there is there is one thing we've missed, though, actually. Um, in, just in case there are any aspiring artists out there, we've not discussed what our characters look like. Great topic, Nick. Tell us what we look like. We look like, or what I look like. Tell us what you look like. All right, so... Captain John Winters, right? Piercing blue eyes with mid-length dark hair loosely pushed up his face and blowing in the breeze. Wears leather armor with a rapier at his side and daggers in a bandolier across his chest. He's got tattoos on his arms and chest and wears an eye patch, despite still having both of his eyes. And he has a beloved black pirate hat that he covets above all else. Uh, I'll have my description by next week. I need to think about it more. I'm not sure what he looks like yet. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'm, I'm just... Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Archie is just this huge, muscular, bald guy. Got a beard going on around his chin. Um, big, bushy, black eyebrows. He's mostly topless. He's got, like, tattoos all over his body. Just your standard, like, big, brawly henchman kind of guy. Nice. Uh, I, I'd say my guy is kind of more like an oily character. He kind of has like a <laughs> greasy beard. Um, you know, like the, um, like he's clean cut, but there's something just like not right when you look at him. It's like, this guy is just, there's something going on there. Like, you know, um, you know, in Aladdin, what's the, um, the evil guy? Jafar. Jafar. Yeah. It's like that kind of a thing. He's got like nice. a pointed beard and a swirling mustache. Nice. <laughs> cool. Good stuff. Um, last thing to say, I think it would be a fun mechanic where I will reward our player characters with experience. If at the start of the campaign, like at the start of each session, you guys have a fun fact about sailing or piracy or like um, nautical history <laughs> that you want to bring to the table. If you want to show nice. up and be like, I read this story about so-and-so, the, the sailor who did X, Y, and Z. And you can give us like, a, you know, a two minute historical take on sailing things. Or if you show up and be like, I read about this new position on a boat. It's called a blah, blah, blah. And this is what they do. Like, if you want to come and educate the rest of the class with sailing or piracy related topics, I will happily uh, dole out some extra XP for that, just as a incentive. Cool. All right. All righty. I like it. We'll see you next week, I guess. See you guys next week for the beginning of Tides of Death. Bye, everyone. Awesome. See you guys. See you then. Bye. Cheers.